Hi, everyone. It's Raghu, and I'm back with Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network. And uh, I have the pleasure of hanging out this afternoon with uh, two young women who have started a really fabulous uh, magazine, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, but uh, the first young woman is Madison Margolin, and Madison is uh, someone I've known. She won't want us to say this, but uh, since she was a little baby, oh my God, look at you now, Madison, kind of a thing. She won't forget that. And her hi. partner, hi, hi, Madison, and her partner, Shelby Hartman. Hi, Shelby. Nice to meet Hello. you. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, now, of course, Madison, I do know that you've been writing for years around the area of psychedelics and uh, marijuana culture, and so uh, I've been following your career, but I don't know much about Shelby. So, Shelby, can you say a little bit about yourself in this? Well, Madison and I had almost bizarrely similar trajectories. We went to Columbia Journalism School at the same time. We graduated Columbia Journalism School and went off into the world uh, writing about spirituality and a variety of things, but really mostly focusing on cannabis before getting into the world of psychedelic drug reporting. It was a totally funny thing how Madison and I met. I was actually reporting a story on cannabis for LA Weekly and I needed a source and I contacted her dad, Bruce, who I think you know, uh, just to interview yeah. him and to get some expertise. And he said, after the interview, well, I don't know if you know this, but my daughter Madison also writes about cannabis for LA Weekly and also went to Columbia Journalism School at the same time as you. Oh, so wow. I reached out to her on Facebook and that's sort of that. Really? Oh, that's a lovely uh, karmic circumstances intervene to pull you together is lovely. Um, so uh, just to say, uh, these guys put together a really beautiful magazine called Double Blind. And uh, I uh, have a, had a chance to go through. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very everybody out there, very substantial, because it's not singularly focused. It has a uh, multiple directions around, of course, psychedelics. But I mean, there's articles. Will you say a little bit about it? What was your purpose here? In what was your mission here, right? In terms of this is not a, a, a high times, okay? It ain't that. So we're using psychedelics as a jumping off point to explore a variety of issues. So right now we're in what's called or what a lot of people are referring to as the psychedelic renaissance in that there's um, FDA approved research happening at Johns Hopkins, NYU, through the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, otherwise known as MAPS, um, uh, MDMA and psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in uh, magic mushrooms, are um, uh, slated to be uh, psychedelic assisted therapy tools uh, by 2021. So there's a lot of um, research happening already that's going on. We also have decriminal we have a decriminalization. Uh, campaign, like a, a psilocybin decriminalization campaign in California, Denver and Oakland have also pursued um, or passed measures around uh, psychedelic uh, decriminalization. So there's a lot of momentum and there needs to be an outlet right now that's focused on covering this movement in a thoughtful, nuanced way, asking questions about the psychedelic industry and the culture and the science and where it's going and how can we sort of keep um, the movement in the industry accountable and ask the questions that really need to be asked. So we're not just talking about psychedelics when we cover psychedelics. We're also covering mental health, spirituality, uh, social equity, environmental justice, um, stuff like that. No, oh, wonderful. Really wonderful. Um, okay, let's, but to, I want to get a little bit more from, from you guys just about, like, it interests me. You, I mean, I know what happened to me back in the day uh, around psychedelics. And uh, Ramdas puts it best. He said, without psychedelics, I wouldn't have been able to really uh, get or grok, which is an old term, absorb who Maharaji is to any extent 
without having that. That was a bit of a precursor for him. And, and I know that for myself as well. So now in your own personal experience, what is it that um, connected you to consciousness mm -hmm. from your experience with psychedelics? Obviously, this interest wasn't in order to put a magazine out or write some wonderful, do some wonderful reporting around psychedelics and marijuana culture, cannabis. So let's get at, okay, you have obviously had experience in this area, and I wonder how that experience informed you the way I just said it informed me to get to India to really be able to... Um, to understand much more of what that really is, what consciousness really is, what reality is, what uh, Ramdas went to India for, which was a map of consciousness. So, so the question being, how has that kind of informed my interest? Okay, perfect. So, um, so I grew up basically in the Ramdas. Um, I grew up with Be Here Now sort of as like a Bible through, you know, in the household. There were several copies all around. Um, it was just something that my parents would tell me. I think I would, when I was younger, I was really embarrassed by it and I would rebel. And, mm -hmm. you know, my parents were like the weirdos who were doing kirtan and not, none of my friends' parents were like this and no one else had Hindu names. And um, part of me was like, you're all a bunch of Jews and you don't understand Hebrew. And so you are now going to go chant in another language that you don't understand. Like what's going on here. And so I, um, I kind of got over being embarrassed of my parents and actually started to really, I read be here now when I was, um, I think like a late teenager and started to appreciate it differently. And I saw, or I recognized that a lot of, where the wisdom comes from is this is sort of an expression of of psychedelic ethos and how it's kind of the next step in psychedelic culture to me in that or the application of those values and, and what i mean by that is ramdas himself was obviously inspired by psychedelics and kind of looking for sort of the next um the next chapter like where does that lead you how can you sort of sustain the ethos and the principles that um that psychedelics maybe introduce you to yeah well and, it, specifically sorry to interrupt but specifically his thing was you know i i this whole wonderful visionary landscape happened with psychedelics but i came down and he mm -hmm. kept coming down as he says in in the film becoming nobody which uh, i know madison you just saw i kept coming down and i wanted to find uh, go to the east to find out how you do it and you don't come down basically right so yeah, yeah. i had a very different upbringing from madison although we're both jewish my parents knew nothing of psychedelics or spirituality we just basically went to synagogue twice a year for yom kippur and rosh hashanah because we were supposed to um but i i had a very powerful ayahuasca experience about five years ago and I came out of it realizing what I think a lot of people realize when they meditate or engage in any form of spiritual practice for the first time, which is that my mind was totally out of control and that I needed to do something to get it <laughs> in that. control. And so it was after that that I began to meditate and I ordered my first copy of Be Here Now and I really just began on this path of spirituality. And I think Madison and I, the reason we're so committed at Double Blind to covering psychedelics is not just because we think psychedelics are an incredibly powerful tool, but because psychedelics are a powerful jumping off point for talking about these much larger conversations around how we can be empowered to become the best versions of ourselves um, using mechanisms that might not be readily available or discussed in our culture. Although, of course, that's changing very quickly with the spread of meditation and yoga around the globe. Yeah, that's beautiful. 
Thank you. <laughs> it's beautiful, <laughs> especially the part. I knew I had to do something about this mind and these thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, for sure. So one of the great things in the publication, uh, just in terms of the articles that I, I waded through, um, but this thing around, so I had a podcast with Rick Doblin, and I've mentioned this in the past, and he, uh, you know, he, of course, talked to me all the, about all the work he's doing with MDMA and uh, even suggested that people like me who uh, you know did a lot of psychedelics early in the game and then got into meditation and all that haven't really done it but now that we are getting to an age where a little reminder might be helpful he said so that's a whole other story but this article uh, and and this so shows the breadth of what's in you guys to share and that's mdma for racial trauma i have not myself heard of, of any of this kind of work going on and i feel um i feel remote from it in the way that uh, in in my own case i am too enclosed in my story and my thing and not i i'm only now starting to wake up a little bit about the re these kinds of realities and the the reality of inclusion uh, related to the kind of uh, work and teachings for instance that ramdas represents but can you talk about this i think this is really an important uh, uh subject yeah. um, you can take turns it's good. <laughs> um so one of the things or one of the questions that are going to become more relevant as the psychedelic um therapy industry really takes off is who has access to it and who it's serving and how the therapists and the subjects um are both going to be able to deal with issues of our time, one of which is systemic racism. Um, so whether it's MDMA helping people uh, with racial trauma, or I know MAPS also is looking at ayahuasca in conflict resolution between Israelis and Palestinians right now. Um, basically, the, que the question is, how can we use psychedelics as a way to, a to become to become more conscious of the issues that are really plaguing us and then also to heal from them on an individual and collective level. So with that article that you mentioned, one of the question is how many therapists really are even equipped to deal with the issues of racial trauma? How many therapists are of color? How many therapists know how to handle a patient who's dealing with the, the whole psychology and the complexities of, of the dynamic of, you know, being of color in America right now and the trauma that comes with it. And, making sure, I mean, really one of the things that we want to make sure that the psychedelic industry, quote unquote, um, is uh, conscientious of is, is accessibility um, to all different types of diverse populations in regard to who has access to this therapy and who's actually able to benefit from it. Yeah. Um, this is something that really most people most white people really cannot relate with at all and that there's a tragic thing behind that and i wonder if this kind of work needs to include people who are not at all able to empathize whatsoever so um yeah I, uh, more support there to me is uh, would be fantastic because it'll also make everybody feel like there's a home for me, right? And um, yeah, I mean, this is also uh, part of what we are spending more time doing at Love Server Member Foundation, which is my other hat aside from this mind rolling gig here. Um, and that is really considering how we bring in uh, everybody as far as i'm concerned everybody can take advantage of some of the great stuff and you know in particular obviously from ramdas but from a host of teachers that we uh, are associated with from jack cornfield on to krishna das um and and how how do we create that inclusion which um we are coming from a, a very tough place ourselves i mean we come from uh england and we come from europe and you know we 
are not really mindful of of the biases that we come into just DNA wise, right? Never mind the habitual patterns that are formed at, at earliest childhood. Anyhow, not to get into a whole thing about it, I think it's really a, a extraordinary work, and I, I would encourage you guys to help. You know, however, however, which way you could. Um, the other thing, and then so we jump from that in the publication uh, to an article called "The Function of Awe," and there were some great things in this. Uh, and um, one thing you you quote this one a poet named Robinson Robinson Jeffers, who I have not heard of, and um, I guess he uh, was in the la- uh, the turn of the last century was when he was around and and he lived at the sea and so this whole article ah this awe article really has to do with ocean water and so on I, it's a really great article i don't know who who wrote this article it's a reporter named zachary slobig he's pretty amazing and there were two sort of there were two sort of motivations for us including that article. Firstly, uh, the theory that he talks about, blue mind, which is a to- term that was coined by the marine biologist and New York Times bestselling author Wallace J. Nichols, in and of itself is just really interesting. It's the theory that there are psycho-spiritual benefits to being close to water. And sort of the relationship between the time that we spend in nature and the compassion that we feel and the duty that we feel towards taking care of the planet. The second reason that we included this article is because more broadly, we're interested in exploring not just the connection between psychedelics and personal healing, or you could replace psychedelics with anything else, meditation and individual healing or prayer and individual healing, but as, as Madison mentioned before, what happens to the community and the planet at large when we begin to work on ourselves as individuals? Obviously, we're facing a dire, dire crisis in the climate right now with oceans rising and you know carbon dioxide levels and everything else. And Meanwhile, we're continuing to engage as consumers in behavior which is extraordinarily detrimental to the environment. And so, you know, we think that it's really important to talk about how people can sort of wake up, not just so that they feel better as they're moving through their everyday lives, but so that they can become better global citizens. Yeah, you know... I, I, and just in chatting with friends and so on about this, you know, there, there's a despair that people have. I, it's just me and that uh, plastic straw I just threw out. Uh, you know, so what is that going to? There's a, you know, that's that's a, a perspective of despair, and um, and we all have it. And that despair to me includes ennui, boredom. In French, it includes laziness. It includes so caught up in me, me story that you can't even think outside that of the interconnectivity, which again goes back to, of course, psychedelics really give you that more than anything in my mind, aside from at times challenging, you know, the uh, attachment to ego and all that stuff. So, uh, and we talked about like, the effect of doing it is behind of taking that straw and finding where where plastic can go, where there's a real re- recycler, and doing that kind of investigation. Um, there's the intention behind actually doing something that sets a vibration out that does have an effect beyond putting the straw in the right place, and, and you know, I mean, and that's something that we we don't ca- take that into account. You know, we don't take into account um, raising children uh, in a way that has that kind of consciousness. And that child then grows up and, and doing what His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, we, we will be saved by women. We will be saved by compassionate mothers. And 
and that creating that kind of environment where that can ha happen, that's an incredible intention and, ac and action. So, um, but you know what? The, I, there's something I want to read from the quote from his article because uh, he's talking about um, cognitive scientists using the latest in functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, um, are, are gathering ev evidence that shows proximity to water, okay? The brain, uh, proximity to water, and even recalling, this is great, even recalling aqu aqu aquatic memories, okay? I was in the ocean uh, the <laughs> other day, huh? Uh, floods the brain with dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, those happiest of enzymes. enzymes. And at the same time, lowers levels of cortisol, that stress-filled enzyme. Water seems to trigger the parts of the brain associated with empathy and encouraging a shift from me to we. I'm actually working on a project with my friend Duncan Trussell about exactly that. Okay? <laughs> I'll have to get in touch with your writer to see if we can quote him. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Talk about that a little bit. I mean, it's not you and it's he writing, but the shift using psychedelics, using um, any kind of methodology, including nature, I mean, is, in, you know, is such a, a going back a little bit to ancient roots by being in forests and so on uh, is a big deal. And everybody who's gone into nature and goes on hikes or goes in the ocean or whatever knows this so what about that all of that in reference to getting out of our boxes and be able to think of of others just talk about you know how you what perspective you guys come from um regarding that with the work that you do i mean the the phrase all one um really resonates and i think is relevant here so with psychedelics what happens is you, the division that you feel between your individual self and ego and the rest of the world kind of starts to dissolve a little bit and you recognize that um, there's sort of a more collective fluid consciousness, however you want to refer to that as God or whatever, um, that is kind of a piece of you and a piece of the other people around you and a piece of the planet and nature and stuff like that. And so I think... Um, at least for me personally, like trying to um, be a little bit more aware of and conscientious of the sort of shared fabric of my quote unquote self and the, mat the material around me um, is really relevant as far as then wanting to take more of a vested interest in actually caring for other people or the environment or whatnot. And so, again, the uh whatever you know the all one really kind of um sums it up in a really succinct way with a lot of interpretation there as well hmm. i just wanted to chime in as well that something that the researchers at hopkins and nyu and others use in order to determine the efficacy of a psychedelic trip is a survey called the mystical type experience questionnaire and it's determined by seven different qualities, which are essentially assessing the extent to which you had a mystical or divine or spiritual experience under the influence of the psychedelic. One of these qualities is unity. Unity meaning that the separation between me and everything else around me has dissolved. The mystical type experience questionnaire is something that was used by sociologists and other researchers long before the psychedelic renaissance began in the early 90s. So this, this questionnaire has also been used to assess the mysticism of experiences caused by fasting, prayer, meditation, and a number of other naturally occurring practices. So, and I think there is a connection there. Additionally, uh, the data shows that when people do have a full-blown mystical experience under the influence of a psychedelic, that the people around that person report that that person is much more sensitive and compassionate to, to their needs. 
And one more thing also is the magnitude of the mystical experience, according to the scientific questionnaire, correlates with the extent to which people are feeling relief from the condition that they were getting the psychedelic therapy for, whether it was addiction or um, term end of life and cancer, anxiety, uh, or depression or something like that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I'm just, you, I love that word unity. Of course, there's a Unitarian church. They're pretty much into it as well. <laughs> unity. Oh God. Um, as Madison, as you may know, because I, by the way, was I one of those people that when I came in and you were a teenager that you go, these goddamn people coming here to chant this weird shit. Was I one of them that you would would have liked to come up to and say, what the f are no, you doing? I mean, you, you and like maybe like three others, um, shout out to Mohan if he hears this. Um, no, like I've known you. I've known you for far too long than I have known. It, I mean, it was really, it, it, I went through a process with it in that when I was little, I took it for granted. I didn't know anything else. And then I, I started elementary school and middle school and I realized, okay, this is a little bit different and weird. And then I came back to it and, um, and started to reappreciate it. But I mean, growing up with it, like, you know, your name was like a household name. It was like, you're, you know, like, yeah, I'm part of the family. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I mean, you, you, every, I, my whole family are made up of weirdos, which I guess would include you, but yeah. I say that in the most loving and endearing <laughs> possible. And I, I too am one of them. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you, you would be honest with me no matter what. Um, <laughs> sorry, Shelby, we got into this little moment here. No, it's no problem. Uh, <laughs> hey, so, you got one thing I'd like to hear a little like out of the blue, because I know Madison, you, I'm not sure Shelby, if, but I think you've probably interviewed a lot of different people around this topic. Um, starting with either one of you, can you think of somebody really that blew your mind and kind of what blew your mind with the person like, like I've done tons of podcasts, as you know, and I never really know what's going to happen. And suddenly a times many a times things happen that i never expected and they were mind blowing hmm. Hmm. some a person or a thing that blew my mind yeah a person that you uh, chatted with regarding this hmm. Hmm. i mean i've i've spoke i've interviewed a lot of people who are incredible to be honest and i feel so blessed to have had the career that I've had so far. So I feel almost bad picking out one person in particular. I would say someone that does come to mind is Kavon Simpson, who is an ayahuasca shaman based out of Brooklyn. He has a he comes from a long lineage of, of healers in Jamaica. And we had a very fascinating conversation about the homophobia within the ayahuasca community. And that was really interesting, wow. but I wouldn't say that it was what he said that struck me as much as it was his energy and the way that he spoke, because I find a lot of times when I'm interviewing people that they seem to be really concerned about saying the right thing and about answering as soon as I ask a question because that's sort of the flow of the interview and there's a lot of pressure around interviews and I totally understand that. But Kavan coming from this long lineage of healers, just he had no problem saying to me when I asked a question, let me just take a moment to breathe and think about it. And then at the end of our interview, I asked him if he had anything else to say. And he once again asked for a moment to take a breath, took one, and then said in the most earnest way, thank you so much for the work that you are doing, telling stories you think matter. And I almost cried. I almost uh, cried. That's beautiful. Um, I guess I have 
one mind blowing experience. I mean, I've had several, but one of them was I sort of got to step inside the life of my sources. Um, and it wasn't really a particular person, but rather a group of people. Uh, I was in Jerusalem and there's a group of sort of like these hippie Hasidish, Hasidic Jewish, um, it's, they're called the Nanachs and they go around the country in these like merry prankster colored vans blasting trance music and they'll like get out at the stop signs and blast their music and dance on top of the vans and in the street and then they'll just go back in their car and they're and that and that's how it goes and they go on these joy rides and the idea is to spread joy and to dance and that they have their followers of this um, old Hasidic Rebbe, um, Rebbe Nachman, who said like the biggest mitzvah or like the biggest good deed or act of service is to be happy. And he, the Rebbe himself is said to have sort of struggled with some like depression and stuff like that. And so uh, what I found interesting is a lot of the people who are in this, in this group of Nanachs who are previously not religious and sort of came to that um, you know, they had a lot of experience with drugs, with trance music, with going to India and Goa and doing that whole scene and coming back to Israel and sort of um, following that path. And um, it, it was really like a meaningful experience in that I got to sort of taste what what that level of freedom felt like, you know, even if it's just jumping out of the car for five minutes and dancing at a street light and the meditation of really moving your body and doing it purely because that's like just for joy and just to spread joy. And I think as simple as it sounds, it really stuck with me and kind of blew my mind. So mm. just for joy. That's what we all need to hear and act <laughs> through just for joy. Wow. Thank you. Those are great. Fabulous. Um, so another thing you got in the magazine, which maybe it's a little, uh, I think it's really important. Um, how to make sense of your last trip. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and you go through these things. Let me ask you about a couple of them. Okay. Remember why you tripped. Okay. Let's talk about that. I'm not sure. Did one of you write this? Can't tell. It's sort of published by the double blind editorial team. Oh, okay. There's no byline right. on that one. Right. Yeah. We'll call it a collaboration. <laughs> okay. Why should we remember? What, what are we talking about? Remember why we tripped? Well, so people trip in many different kinds of ways and in many different kinds of contexts. And I don't want to say that one way of tripping is more legitimate than another way of tripping. That being said, that article, the context of it is that it comes out of an emerging field called psychedelic integration therapy, which is essentially, a, you know, a now a, a field that is established protocol for preparing for your trip, having your trip, and then processing your trip once it's over. And one of the principles of psychedelic integration therapy is to try to set an intention before going into your trip. Typically, it's ideal if it's something that is simple. You don't want it to be, you know, a paragraph long because anyone who's done a psychedelic knows when you're under the influence, you might not remember a paragraph. So something simple like, I am patient, or I am compassionate, or I am whatever, happy. And, um, and so that's sort of the idea behind that, that tip is if you did go into your trip with some kind of intention, something you wanted to let go of, or something you wanted to understand that you should remember that in the, in the days following when the world might be glowing or the world might be darker than you anticipated so that you can come back to your reason for having done what you did and see if there was anything in that experience that gave you what you were looking for. Mm. You know, not that long ago, Ramdas was asked by, I think it was New Age, not New Age Journal, Yoga Journal. Yoga Journal is no more New Age. Uh, they were doing a, an extensive article around psychedelics. I don't know if you saw it. It was earlier this year, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and so they pose a bunch of questions. So he and I worked on it together. 
And <laughs> this is slightly embarrassing, but we talked about set and setting, just what you just talked about. And I was like, yeah, well, I know what setting is and get everything right and the candles and the right music and environment. Uh, but what about set? I never even thought about it. I knew it all these years. And of course, at the time when the engagement with it was a lot, a, a hell of a lot more than it has been recently, I not sure that I would have been actually well served to have thought about that a little bit more. So, uh, and, and of course, Ramdas just went through what you just described, of course, the intention. And by the way, um, maybe this is a good tip at this point from uh, that comes from when Ramdas gave Neem Karoli Baba a huge hit of acid that he had, white lightning actually, from the back in the day, Laguna Beach, and uh, nothing happened to him. Uh, but what he did say about it is it allows you to have Darshan, be in the presence of Christ, okay, the divine presence. He, he called it Christ. And in that presence, uh, you're there for a couple of hours maybe. But then you've got to come back. You're kicked out. And so ultimately, the best is feed, feed and love people. That'll get you there. Um, but he also said that this is good for beginners. Basically, this is good. So this, um, uh, the idea of having that in your mind and also the idea of the, the intention. And so Ramdas talked about Every one of us has in, the, in our deepest place, it's called so many different things. The Buddhists call it nirvana. They call it Buddha mind, soul, uh, Christ consciousness, um, the non, you know, of course, the one that represents the many. There are so many different names. But I think that uh, having the intention to allow that which is ineffable and we really don't have a good word for it. Um, my, my simple word is uh, just undefended heart, okay, which we can all, I think, relate to because of how much we defend our hearts. If we put some trust there in terms of a set, in terms of intention, that, that, that we do trust that and the deepest intuition and and allow that to take care of us in 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 the uh, working with the method of psychedelics. So I don't know. I just thought I'd mention that because that that's very. I think what you guys have written here, and there's a you know, uh, w the next thing I wanted to talk about was seek an understanding community. So for me, that's one of the most important thing. So I think they're very useful. Well, I just want to, you mentioned one thing and I think it's really important is especially with sort of the whole be here now consciousness and using, you know, psychedelic healing and using um, meditation to sort of heal yourself. Maharaji said it, which was just feed everybody, right? So what is the application of that? Like once you're dealing with yourself, it's not enough just to deal with yourself, but then you have to look outside yourself and feel the connectedness with other people. And the most simple way you can do that is through some sort of service. And if you want to sort of, if you want to serve the experience that you had, whether it's on a psychedelic or a religious experience or, or something like that, the best way to do that is to then, um, do something that is going to connect you to helping another living thing. Um, and so I really like with double blind specifically, it's using, using wellness and psychedelics and meditation and consciousness and all of that as just a jumping off point into action. And whether the action is feed everybody or kind of whatever your, your uh, you know, good deed is. I think whatever your really inspiration important. is, is maybe another good word. Yeah. Um, well, some of the other things, seeking and understanding community. Um, of course, the for Buddhists, there's the vow of uh, taking refuge, right? Taking refuge in the Buddha, taking refuge in the Dharma, and taking refuge in the satsang community. 
And when the Buddha was asked, which of those three is the most important, of course, he said, community, Sangha. And so uh, that is on every level through the use of psychedelics as a methodology to the use of uh, kirtan, you mentioned chanting, uh, the centering of that in a spiritual community is extraordinarily helpful on every level. So I, I'm glad that's in. You also have honor the limitations of your mind. Very important because you're going to come to the end of them. Can you, who's got a good example of the limitations of their mind in uh, either in, in a psychedelic experience or not? Okay, tell me. Give me one. Probably Alex Gray or any artist that's felt compelled to paint their experience. Is a good is a good idea of what the limitation of the mind is. Yeah. Probably, I would say. You can't really describe it. Another one of the qu the qualities of the mystical experience on psychedelics is ineffability, which means there are no words that can actually accurately portray what you just went through, and so. You know, if we're trying to use language to describe what um, what a psychedelic means, is we're not. It's not going to be adequate, probably. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why it's particularly important to have that principle in there is because we live in a society that places so much emphasis on going down the analytical rabbit hole. You know, that is the, the model for cognitive behavioral therapy and so many of the other, um, you know, psychological models that we see in sort of more traditional medical settings all across the United States and the world. And that just does not work once you start entering the realm, as you can, sh I'm sure, tell us better than, than we could talk about it because you've been on this path much longer than we have. But once you start, you know, you reach a certain point with your meditation or your psychedelic or whatever it might be where it's like, I have to go into my body. I have to go into my heart. I have to breathe. I have to surrender. Right on. <laughs> right on. Absolutely. You know what else I think of though, when about this honor, the limitations of your mind. I also think, Honor the place when you start to realize you are not your mind, you are not your thoughts, and you're not your story. Once you can start to, we can start to honor that part of ourselves, we are nurturing that, what you just referred to as the ineffable, because that ineffable is in e each one of us. Yeah, I mean, I'd say a big thing is becoming a conscious observer of your own thoughts and mind and also and also your body, you know, whether it's you're feeling an anxiety in your stomach in a way that your mind can't really process or articulate or, or you know, whatever, or you have back pain or something like that. It's being able to recognize the way that our that psychedelics can wake us up to our whole central nervous systems and the way that we're programmed and, and whole, you know, the, how people kind of develop all sorts of you know, uh, bowel issues or whatnot because they have all this unresolved stuff that um, psychedelics are helping to to resolve with trauma. But yeah, to consciously observe that that's happening from a from a backseat to your own to your own mm -hmm. consciousness. Yeah, you just got to be careful. And Ramdas, of course, talks about the witness a lot. Using that, it's a part of mindfulness practice. That it's not from the little guy that's going you asshole you really did that that isn't what it is it's breathing in as we just talked about into the center of our chest and coming from uh what well, ramdas calls it loving awareness mm -hmm. so that you're not judging and killing yourself every second which most of us do much of the time here's another one cultivate a meditation practice that probably is integral to work with psychedelics mm -hmm. Some of these principles may seem obvious, have a community, meditate, journal, but they're not as obvious as you would think. I did a story for Vice, I don't know how many years ago now, when psychedelic integration therapy was really kind of coming onto the scene. And I interviewed this guy who lived in, I can't remember where, I want to say it was Kentucky, but it was a state where 
Suffice it to say, there isn't a strong psychedelic or mindfulness community, but he had been struggling for some time and he heard on the Joe Rogan experience about ayahuasca and he decided to go down to the Amazon and drink ayahuasca. And then he came back to a town where nobody had heard of ayahuasca, nobody meditated, nobody had a spiritual practice, and he just felt alone. And so one of the reasons why we feel that it's so important to be putting something like double blind out now is because with the growing popularity of ayahuasca, as well as the decriminalization of psilocybin, you're seeing that more and more people are interested in psychedelic drugs. And so they go off and they do one and then what, right? This isn't a one-time thing that you do a psychedelic and Voila. And meditation has been shown in the Johns Hopkins studies and other research to be a very powerful tool for processing and holding on to the lessons that we discover while we're tripping. So you don't just trip, have all these revelations and then go back to your iPhone like nothing ever happened. As they say in French, that would be dommage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh God, and that's, um, it's, it is a wonderful tool. And of course, uh, it also, like all tools, can be abused and is abused. And I myself remembering me abusing it, you know, way back when. And um, so what you're doing here and giving some sustenance for people sharing what it would be good for all of us to share, uh, especially around uh, the intention part that we talked about before. Uh, the set, uh, really, I mean, it, it can change our experience so radically, you know? And, um, and actually, you can take that in all of our lives that we start to have, we, we use set, on a day-to-day -day basis, which we bring our intention into what it is, which is around mindfulness, of course, but the intention, uh, you know, Madison, you just talked more about it, um, to really be able to uh, do the kinds of th work that we need to do on ourselves using whatever methodology so that we can be of some service. And what, el what else is there? You, you wrote an article, uh, The Meaning of Life, which, um, in, in the publication and you know and it's about what more of the work that's being done to prove through uh, molecular biology hey we are all one we really are and we're proving you know his holiness the dalai lama has been involved in this for years uh in terms of working with neuroscientists and so on proving what these tibetan that version of reality is pretty real and you know that's all amazing uh but you know, I always think like around the idea of getting enlightened or around the idea of what's the meaning of life. We can get it down to, for me, it's simple terms. And it's what, it's what we just said and what you said earlier is there is nothing to do but work on ourselves and be able to share the radiance and the joy that we can be with whoever we happen to come into contact with with and uh that's to me a large part of the meaning of life and and you guys are really doing some wonderful work to help people realize that and work with uh, this this these are sacred herbs these and and they need to be treated as as such thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay got all right well, anything else that you guys can add to the equation in terms of uh, what you're planning to do, where are you going with this all, and what some other plans that you have? Tell us. Um, so we, uh, we're a digital media platform. We have a biannual print magazine and also an online component to our content. Uh, so we'll be coming out with a second print um, around December. And also we're, we're planning some events on the horizon. So. Uh, you should look out for that. My, anything else you want to? I think you covered it. I think we covered double blind mag on social media. Mm, great. Um, I just want to thank you really for, aside from all the work you're doing, which is all great, 
it it's you're both of you are are so thoughtful about all of this in a very substantial and deep way and you know the, you're what it's about moving forward in, in terms of uh, hopefully we're going to evolve out of some of some radical ignorance that we seem to be uh, caught in, which the Hindus call the Kali Yuga, the age of destruction. So we want to don't want to get too dramatic around that, but yet some really tough stuff is happening. So th the work that you're doing, this is this is really great, and I appreciate it, and I, I appreciate you as a representative of next generation too. So Thank thanks, you. thanks, Madison, Shelby. It's been great to uh, hang with you this afternoon. <laughs> All right, and. Uh, so uh, for everyone out there, you can go to the show notes on uh, BeHereNowNetwork.com slash MindRolling, and we'll have links to the publication so you can see it online, all of it, and see what else these gals are up to. And uh, we will see you next week on MindRolling. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Raghu.